Hi, I'm Connor Kelly O'Brien. I am an actor, writer, and I am the co-founder and executive director of the Scranton Fringe Festival. I'm here talking with a good friend, colleague, community activist, graphic designer, and event planner, Jess Mione. How you doing, Jess? Doing great, Connor. How are you? Good. Does it feel natural? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I wanted to start off with just a little bit about who you are, some of your past work. Um, some of these questions are going to seem silly since I know most of the answers, but <laughs> for our friends out there who don't. Um, can you tell me um, a little bit about how you got your start in event planning, graphic design, you know, community engagement, all that fun stuff? Um, so I was in college, when freshman in college, when I started to think about what I can do for the community in a sense that um, I wanted to gather people together. And I didn't really think of myself as uh, a leader in that realm at all up until the point I started reading about um, feminism. And I started reading about uh, Lady Fest, which was a um, an art and music festival that happened in 2000 in uh, Olympia, Washington. And um, they wanted to raise money for women's resources in the community with through art and music. And that's where I first created um, that event for the first time, jumping in the dark, totally not knowing what I was doing with uh, permits and everything like that in the city. <laughs> that can be a challenge. As an 18-year-old. <laughs> I can understand that challenge. Um, talking a little bit more about Lady Fest, um, you talked about the original one in Washington. And I had I was involved in your first one here, but for those that don't know, can you tell me? Can you pick you know paint us the picture of what did Lady Fest of Scranton look like in a general sense? So I was thinking of where could I host something that uh, could gather a good good size amount of people, and um, I had it up at Nayog Park, um, and I basically got into that because I was writing this paper in my freshman seminar class mm -hmm. at Marywood. Uh, on the three waves of feminism that came about and um, yeah I don't know it, I think it was a, a really fun venture into uh, not knowing what to do but not being fearful of maybe doing the wrong thing and just learning along the way as an activist an organizer. That's beautiful. Um, why do you you do a lot of other events so this question is probably gonna seem stupid but why did you stop Lady Fest specifically and branch off into things like Zine Fest, Girls Night, Punk Rock Flea Market, where at the center you're still doing the same things, mm -hmm. but you're just not doing it as that specific thing. Well, it actually changed for me when I um, I was starting to make zines. Mm -hmm. Which, what is a zine? A zine is like a, a self-made publication, uh, a magazine of sorts, if you, if you want to go in that direction. It could be little art books. It's just hand-published literary content that you make all by yourself. You, you, you you write it, you make the pictures, you staple it together. If, if people out there wanted to know more, see examples, do you have any recommendations online or where to look or what to research? Just Google a zine? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can Google a zine, but there's a really good book called What You Mean, What's a Zine? I recommend that book because it shows you how to construct it, the history of it. Um, what You Mean, What's a Zine? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people say zine. <laughs> so when I go like magazine, you know. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what made me want to go in that direction was um, right after Lady Fest, I went to Philadelphia to the Philly Zine Fest, and um, at the time I felt like I was I was tabling there, and I, I walked into a room filled with I guess to me a culture of people that already had that established there. If you go to Philly, everybody knows what a zine is. Maybe they're just like. A little bit more of alternative there so they know what you're talking about here not so much so when I went in I kind of felt like a number I kind of felt like I was you know I was not necessarily just one of the gang but I was just kind of like I walked in I wasn't greeted I like I, I just found a table I sat down I don't want to say that I felt outcasted but that made me going forward with any event, want to make it so personalized for anybody that like came to my event as an attendee or um, as you know a performer, anybody that sat down. You saw a lacking in a culture that you otherwise love and you wanted to, I hate to use the word correct it, but improve. Yeah, definitely improve. I wanted to make people feel special when they walk through the door anywhere. And so 
it, I did contemplate, do I do another Lady Fest? I don't know yet. Um, and then I realized that I was just so into writing and, and creating the art for these publications that I wanted to also expose Scranton to something like that. And I had people come from Philly and Brooklyn and places like that to come here mm -hmm. and encourage people here to make zines too. Especially, when I was under 21 at the time and I also saw that as like a huge like, um, you know, we need a voice for people that are like 18, 19 years old. I know, we were babies. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that being said, um, so you started Zine Fest. How mm -hmm. many years has it been going on now? Um, about 10. About 10 years, oh my God. Um, but lately I've noticed in the past maybe year or two, it's kind of evolved into, it's still Zine Fest, but it's also a punk rock flea market. And you seem to kind of have uh, amalgamated those two brands and identities. Why and what have, the, what have been the results of that? So, um, to better open it up to various formats of like alternative creation that people have, um, I've seen that just not centralizing on just one particular alternative medium, I guess, and opening it up to people that paint, photography. In a, in a sense, it is basically an art market mm -hmm. of sorts. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that the, the nature of things being a little bit strange or unusual um, and it, it, that caters to that kind of demographic mm -hmm. and people that make zines fall right into that too. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a natural way to blend it together. I was doing it separately. So like all last year I did like three just punk rock flea markets. There's people there that had zines, mm -hmm. but it was like largely like handcrafted items, mm. um, clothing, screen printing, a lot of people that, there's like a big music component too, like a lot of records, a lot of cassette mm. tapes, uh, analog type of materials. Would you say that that culture and that industry of people who buy vinyl and people who buy old records or people who buy cassette tapes, and there's still musicians that publish on those mediums, do you think that that's still going strong in, in certain circles or do you see that trend waning? No, I definitely think that people that are going to collect vinyl, they're probably going to do it forever, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, there's definitely, you know, ease of access with Spotify and, like, mm -hmm. other streaming services like that. But, of course, people that collect vinyl are going to tell you about the nostalgia that they feel mm -hmm. or, like, um, you know, you get to open it up. You get to read the liner notes and things like that. Are so. you one of those people? Yeah. <laughs> Not often, but I, I used to have a lot more uh, records, but... Um, I kind of just like kept the ones that I feel like are like rare or I'm not going to be able to find them anywhere else. To me, it is a different listening experience. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's the right way or the best way, but... Uh, it's definitely unique. Yeah. What are some of those records? If I was to, if we were to magically transport your collection right here, what would be some things in that collection? Uh, Talking Heads first album. Okay. Uh, lots of Joy Division. Ooh. Uh, they're one of my favorite bands. Yeah. Um, I love the Carpenters, <laughs> Black Sabbath. <laughs> you said that almost embarrassingly. You're like, I, I love the Carpenters. Uh, I love the Carpenters. Uh, I love Karen Carpenter as like a drummer. Yes. yes. Um, I Which a lot of people her. I don't think know that. Yeah. That, that or she... like, um, I love the Velvet Underground, Mo Tucker, mm -hmm. drummer for the uh, Velvet Underground. Okay. Great too. Fabulous. That kind of stuff. I well, I grew up on kind of like my um, my mom and my dad's music, so I was like so influenced by the '60s. Mm -hmm. What are you listening to nowadays? Is there, without discrediting any of that, is there anything that's come out in recent years that's, if I was to rip open your phone or iPod right now, what would be? You know, the one record I constantly, I, I listen to tons of Pink Floyd, but okay. um, the one, I don't want to say it's newer, it was released newer, but it was recorded in the 70s, is uh, this woman, Sybil Bear. Okay. She is, uh, I believe, from Belgium, and she was just like a teenager who recorded in her bedroom, and then... Um, one of the members of Dinosaur Jr. found it okay. and published it years later, like wow. back in, in like 2011. It's so beautiful. It is like a like lo-fi, like folky acoustic. It's it's that like one wonderful. of the most beautiful albums I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. um, bringing it back to Zine Fest and the and the and the punk rock or art markets. You mentioned that it's a combination of people from our region, uh, from this region, mm -hmm. and people from like New York, Philly, etc. How have you, what has been the experience of your artists and vendors that are from outside the area coming in? I'm always curious for what new artists and creatives think of our region and our... I think the first thing they always think of is the office. Sure. <laughs> but once they get past that, I what I try to do is I try to aim Zine Fest on a first Friday weekend so mm. that they can get a glimpse of like 
you know, the kind of scene that we have here, we could walk around to all the art galleries mm -hmm. and uh, check everything out. And I don't think it's as um, stuffy as some people think it is either. I think that maybe people aren't going to all of the places. I was just going to say, um, yeah, I mean, on the same token, so with the Fringe Festival, year one, back in 2015, we over we started on a Thursday, and it was October 1st, Friday weekend. And then it, for year two, year three, year four, we were on our own weekend. And then last year, we went back to October 1st, Friday. Part of the challenge with us is that it overlaps with um, well, what is mostly commonly known as the Columbus Day holiday weekend. Mm. So it's a challenge of the hotels are booked, the marathon. Um, but something that we found a lot through doing that was that, it re, you know, while it's nice to do an event on your own and it's nice to keep the arts and culture vibe going, mm -hmm. there is something powerful about showing off, I especially think downtown Scranton, mm -hmm. on like its best night of the month. Right. And I agree with you. I talk with a lot of people that are like, oh, they have an idea for something and then they're chatting with me and they're like, well, this would never go in Scranton. And I don't say this, but I want to be like, that's pedestrian compared to some things I've already seen happen in Scranton. There's nothing wrong with that, but like, do you ever feel that way that people are like, oh, I want to do X, Y, and Z, but that wouldn't work in Scranton? And do you ever look at them like? Yeah, I mean, like, I know that even with, you know, my events, there's there's people that are going to love it and people that are going to hate it, but I n never think, oh, I shouldn't do this one thing. This is too crazy. This is too out there. Like, I think it, there's all different people here and mm -hmm. probably more people that relate to what you want to do than you realize. And so instead of hiding away in your house and not exposing that art, mm -hmm. what is the harm of going out there and actually doing it and making a statement? And so, you know, are we I, I, up against like Brooklyn and Philly and places like that? I try to say that we're always like their little brother, mm -hmm. Scranton's little brother. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. To me, it's are those the same people that are just simply afraid to expose it because they automatically assume it's not going to go over well? I think it's a combination of that. And to be fair, our region does have a very, you know, coal dust mentality that I think that maybe... I will say I think you and I are probably the last generation that grew up with traces of that. I think that, like, you know, I was you and I were chatting before we started filming about how I went and spoke at my old high school... Um, not too long ago, and I thought I was going to come in there and like blow their minds with my <laughs> progressive, worldly ways, and they were leaps and bounds ahead of me in terms of culture and acceptance and you know uh, awareness of what's happening both in their local and national and international lives. Um, I th I think part of it is like anything fear, um, and I think that I think that they have genuine. I think with you know especially everything we're seeing happening with local corruption and scandals and stuff like that, even though those don't really impact the same sphere we're talking about, I think the community self-esteem, like I truly believe our community has gone through trauma mm -hmm. at a community level. And that sounds super esoteric and, you know, uh, you know, philosophical in a way. I don't even know if I used esoteric right in that sentence. But the idea being that I think we as a community just have a lack of self-esteem. And I don't mean as individuals, but I mean like as a community, it's like, well, let's do this. No, it's just going to, you know, suck and it's not going to happen. I think it, from speaking from like the music scene perspective, I think mm -hmm. it definitely goes in waves. Mm -hmm. There's venues that will come up here and venues that will die out. Mm -hmm. But it always comes back to me. And if people have to do it like quite literally on the fringe and make something that maybe isn't a venue and put their art in there and like host it as a pop-up shop. If you build it, they will. If, if you build you, it. And, they, and you market it, yes. they will come. Which brings me to my next topic. <laughs> Get on that segue. Um, which is graphic design. You are a fabulous, fabulous, she is a fabulous oh God, graphic good. designer. You really are, and I'm, I, I'm not pandering. Um, your work is phenomenal. Um, and we'll talk about where they can find it later. Um, well, I'll say it now. Where can, they, where can we find some of your work? JessMione.com. JessMione.com. We'll say that again later. <laughs> but so right now you are you are a graphic designer and you do all the graphic design for your own events, mm -hmm. such as Girls Night at Ale Mary's, the Zine Fest and Punk Rock Flea Markets, 
old events you used to do like Lady Fest. You have a very specific interesting event coming up as TEDx Scranton. We'll get to that in one second. But what do you do? Um, is that what you do full time or do you have a, is there another graphic design job you have? You mentioned something about Honesdale. I, yes, I, so I am the designer at a, a financial institution in Ooh. Honesdale, which is. She is doing well. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, pretty funny because it's like the whole corporate side of the world mm -hmm. designing for, but I actually like it because I worked at ad agencies before, different places where I have to put like an immense amount of like um, mental capacity into creating things. And at my jobs, my full-time jobs, I would love to like know a brand, be it corporate or creative or whatnot, know the brand so well that like I put my mind on autopilot. I know the fonts I have to use, the color scheme, everything, the kind of imagery that they want to go for. Then I take like my actual creative out there concepts and use it for my personal stuff. I love that. And how long have you been with this financial institution? Almost a year now. Okay. Yeah. And do you feel you have the swing of it? What do you think about Honesdale in general? I love it. I actually think that like people from Scranton would really enjoy going up there. I totally agree. I've done some work at the Cooperage mm -hmm. project before. Um, several times actually, so I've spent a lot of time up in Honesdale. It's a really, I hate to use the word cute, but it's a really cute town. It is, town. it looks like a Norman Rockwell painting or something. <laughs> it does, Honesdale at Christmas, and I love Scranton, but in Northeast Pennsylvania, I think it's one of the prettiest mm -hmm. spots to go to, especially up in the mountains, oh, so cute. Um, but moving on, I mentioned a little while ago that you are planning an event coming up soon in Scranton, TEDx, mm -hmm. uh, for anyone familiar with the TED Talks, mm -hmm. this is a local version of that, that I, from what I understand is not you can't just get permission to do that e simply. Can you very simply walk us through what it's like to be an official TEDx uh, event? Yeah, so uh, there's an application process. Mm -hmm. And um, if you pass this very lengthy application process, they grant you a license. If I um, keep on continuing to do a, a, the event consecutively, I hold the license. But because I've taken years off from running the event, I have to reapply all the time. Gotcha. You could get rejected from that. Um, they'll tell you to fix things in your application. Um, it's, pr it's pretty detailed. They're very protective of their brand. I was Before you came here, I, I tried to look through the rules very quickly to mm -hmm. get a sense of understanding. One of the things that stood out to me was that they limit your attendance to 100. Yeah. Flat. What is the reasoning behind that? Or you, is there an answer? Well, they want you to attend one of their larger TED events, oh, okay. and then you can have it's like kind of like a secondary license that you obtain mm -hmm. from that. Um, then you can go back and if you organize a local TED X event, then you can have more than one hundred. Okay, I so don't it's really a, it, know. The so rationale. it's a means of getting you to invest further into the brand. I think so. Yeah. What made you want to produce a TED X event in Scranton? Um, uh, one of the first TED talks that I saw was called Connected but alone by Sherry Turkle. And uh, she also wrote um, an article for the New York Times, I believe. Okay. And that is the first time I saw a TED Talk. And that totally, I don't want to say it changed my life, but it really, like, at that time, it spoke to me that, like, we're always in our devices. We're not, you know, we're going through the motions of having relationships and having conversations, but are we really? And mm -hmm. that's kind of what the whole talk was about. Fabulous. And so I was kind of just browsing on their website, and it asked how to get more involved like locally on, and so I was just like yeah maybe I'll get it maybe I won't and I applied and totally forgot that I had applied and then they don't get back to you for like six months later and I was like oh my god I got it. So who else is involved in the planning process with you? You are um, the head organizer of course. Um, Alicia Grega has been really helpful as like a speaker coach um, and then I have some of my friends that are just volunteering the day of um, but there's also two huge sponsors, um, Marywood University sponsoring the venue and the catering, so really grateful for that. Go and, Marywood. And Ionic Development is doing all the recording and production. That's amazing. Um, when is it, where is it again, and can you give me some of the speakers? Sure, um, so it's March 7th, that's a Saturday, um, the week before Parade Day, for everyone worrying. <laughs> Um, Have you been asked that question a lot? Yeah, I, yeah people kind of were freaking out because they almost thought it was on parade day. And I thought that that was really hilarious because I'm Italian and of course I partake in the parade, but I'm also kind of just like, <laughs> I don't know, a little bit. They have their priorities. <laughs> right, so I was just like, okay, I will not have it that day. Right. Um, it's at Marywood uh, in the School of Architecture building. 
Okay. That's important to know. Um, and it's uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Wow, that sounds awesome. Uh, how much are tickets and where can someone go to find them? They're $10 and they're sold out. The event is sold out? One day. The, half of them were gone by 9 a.m. Congratulations. Yesterday. You So you sold out. So how long did it take you to sell out 100 tickets? Um, maybe like nine hours. But like I had them on sale like midnight on Friday. Mm -hmm. So just like the very start of uh, February 1st and then... Congratulations. That's amazing. So, oh no, we can't get tickets. Mm. Is, am I, can I ever see those talks somewhere? Yes, so they will be totally recorded by Ionic Development and they will be put on YouTube forever. Ooh, for when, um, so if we're seeing this in the future um, and we look up TEDx Scranton, we should be able to find, do you have an approximation of when you think those videos are gonna be available to the public? I'm gonna say like maybe like um, a month after. So or we're so. looking April 2020. Yeah, I would say so. Fantastic. Well, congratulations. Thanks. That must be exciting. Was it a relief to see that it sold out? I was like astounded. I, I think that's awesome. I would you say would you attribute some of that not only to the brand and the interest in the brand, but I think you did especially on social media and through you know media relations. I think you did a really good job of prepping people for the launch. How long have you been, how long, so when, when did you announce like, this is the date tickets go on sale on February 1st, whatever, blah, blah, blah? Um, probably like two months ago or so. So you've been giving people ample time. Yeah. And yeah. I think, and I, I think also, would you agree that the, the, the strict limit on the tickets probably incites an interest? Yeah, definitely. And with there being 13 speakers, I know that's a lot of their family and friends would want to see them. So if you divide the audience like that, mm -hmm. depending on the, if they told their family members to get the tickets right away, I think that's probably one of the reasons why I filled up fast. Sure, but don't, that shouldn't limit your hard work. So that's TEDx Scranton on March 7th. Sold out. So that's that. <laughs> but you can find them on YouTube starting mm -hmm. in April. That's fantastic. Um, I want to talk a little bit about we've we've talked we've touched on events you've planned and we talked a little bit about this but what do you you, you reference Scranton's art scene as like the little brother of like Brooklyn or Philly and I don't think you're wrong um, something that we talk about a lot at the festival and other uh, organizations I'm involved in is that Scranton is such a good development launching pad. Thing. And that doesn't mean you can't have a full-fledged career here. I'm not saying that, but you know, I split my time. Lately, it's primarily been in New York. I live in Harlem, um, but I still work in Scranton. I still run the festival here with Elizabeth Bowen and our board. But there, you know, we are relatively affordable. We have beautiful venues. We have phenomenal resources. I mean, Marywood and Ionic, you know, development alone for you and your. That's just one event on one day. Um, ECTV and you know, our lovely partners here. Why, what do you, I, I feel, and I don't know if, I wanna hear if you agree or disagree, long way to say this. People from outside of the area who come in for the festival, who come in for the Shakespeare Festival, who come in for Zine Fest and your events, seem to have a deeper appreciation for what we have than sometimes I feel regional-based artists do. Agree, disagree? Yeah, I definitely think so. A um, lot of times my friends have said, why don't you move to New York mm -hmm. or Philly? Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say I'll feel like a small fish in a big pond, mm -hmm. but in a way I will. And I kind of like the challenge mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. of constantly developing, you know, how am I going to make this better next time? Yeah, I've, talk, I've told people a million times, if it wasn't for the fact that there, I think there are most careers in the arts and most creative paths you can achieve here. The only challenge that I have as an actor is that there isn't a lot of paid acting work, and that's really what I love to do. Mm -hmm. um, from an artist side, my administrator side, I, I feel fulfilled. Um, if I didn't have to move to New York to be on auditions and to be in shows and trying to get on TV and shows and stuff like that, I would live here full time. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love it here. But again, and I mean with, with travel, of course, but again, I, I do think that if you can reasonably build a career in a region, there's nothing stopping you from, and if there's something about your scene you don't like, then change it or, or find someone who can change it. Because I understand some issues are bigger than one person. Now you and I were talking briefly about, you have, a, you have one particular constructive criticism with event planning and arts and culture in our region. What is that? From a, this, we were talking about scheduling shows and events and stuff like that. 
I'm not sure. We were talking about scheduling. Scheduling. Venue. Remember we were saying like if you want to book a venue or an event space? Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I think that because we're in you know 2020, there should be an easier way to simply make a request online on the website. Mm -hmm. And it's, to me, a very lengthy process to try and get anything booked anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not to say that I'm not willing to do the, the footwork and, right. and whatnot, but I feel like there should be a calendar. You should just be able to select a date, perhaps put a deposit down, PayPal, yeah. it, something like that. I think that I think that that, I think one of the good things about our region is that it's so intimate, but with that, I think also creates unnecessary, well, I got to call you back next week after I talk to Debbie. Debbie handles the event book. I'm just making, I don't know, I'm not referencing anything in particular, but I absolutely, Karen, Karen <laughs> I absolutely agree with you. Um, it's been so nice talking with you. Um, before we go, at the end of every show, I'm trying to ask a rapid fire round of questions to oh. the guests. This is just silly, take a breath, just say whatever comes to mind first. Most of this is going to be personal. Okay, and, and just, you know, just to give us a snapshot of who you are. Um, you wake up in the morning, coffee or tea? Coffee. What's your favorite color? Green. What band are you listening to at the moment? The Smiths. Okay, <laughs> um, What band did 16-year-old Jess probably listen to the most? The Smiths. Smiths. Okay, fabulous. <laughs> um, or a movie that's really spoken to you lately? Oh. Oh, no. Um... Okay, we'll come back to that. Know. It's okay. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> That's okay. Um, anything you're binging right now? Mm, no. oh, oh, God. Like, gosh. I'm so blank. No, like, it's okay. Literally every day I just go to work and listen to Big Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, is there one organization or venue in, in Northeast Pennsylvania that you haven't had a chance to work with yet that you may someday really like to? Oh, wow. I know there's many, but just if you had to pick one. You know what? I actually really always wanted to work with um, Leadership Lackawanna. I never had yeah. the chance to. You really? You absolutely should. I have applied before. Okay. Um, and I did get in, and then like stuff came up. Schedule couldn't but, work. Um, I would definitely love to somehow, someday. I can promise you they would adore you, <laughs> and they would want you like in a nanosecond. Um, salty or sweet? Oh, salty. Salty. If you could prepare, like magically create a perfect meal in front of us right now, what would it be to you? A falafel. Ooh, from anywhere in particular? Homemade? Family made? Oh, yeah, I, I could try to make it myself. I probably am not that great at it. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to try Savory Maza. Okay, very nice. Um, what's your favorite coffee shop in our region? Oh, wow. Uh, I know. Uh, I like a Dezo. That is so funny. That is the second person in a row who said <laughs> that. They're, no, and they're, that's not an insult to any other coffee shop, but I think they have the right balance. Their atmosphere is really cool. I will say this, I, Adezzo's atmosphere I think is amazing and I really love like working there and being there. Northern Lights hot spice vanilla chai, mm. like I would pump into my blood if, I, <laughs> if it was not going to kill me. Um, last question I wanted to ask you, if there was someone out there who wants to plan an event, who wants to be the next Jess Mione of wherever they, this video and its scores of audience members might reach them, what would you tell them? What's like step one? Uh, just jump in the dark and do it anyways. That's how I learned. You kind of just, yeah. there's no, to me, real handbook to do this kind mm -hmm. of thing, um, especially because it's kind of customized to whatever city that you're in as yeah. well, and you have to like, you know, go by those restrictions. I find that a lot of time when people ask questions like that, the people who ask specific questions, like how do I get XYZ permit or how do I reach out to sponsors, those are the people that are gonna make it happen. It's the people that are like, well, how do I do it? It's like, you just have to do it. Just talking to people. You, you know, you, you gather like knowledge from so many resources. And I think you have to have a certain candor and, and a, an approach with people and knowing like you're, you're going about it that like, hey, I wanna work with you. I want us to do this and this and come together and make this bigger thing. Well, thank you for coming together and making this bigger thing. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, where can people learn more about your work? Uh, JessMione.com. If they want to check out the speakers, we have uh, TEDx TEDxScranton.com. Okay, so JessMione.com or TEDxScranton.com. I've been Connor Kelly O'Brien. I've been speaking with Jess Mione. You can find more about her at JessMione.com or her upcoming sold-out event at TEDxScranton.com. Until next time, thanks so much. 